Okay. So hi everyone. Uh, we're happy to have Meng here today, who's going to tell us about a defective look at quantum phases. So please take it away, Meng. Uh, thanks, uh, Apoof and Lakasha and Sakura for inviting me. So um, okay. It's a, it's a great pleasure to uh, speak at this symmetry seminar. It has been sort of my uh, no main source of information to uh, to catch up with the really rapid development in this subject. Um, so, okay, does it work? Okay, so what I want to discuss today is in some sense applied generalized symmetry. Um, let me actually go back to my first slide. Uh, applied generalized symmetry, this is how I, through sort of thinking about it in um, the context of uh, gaps of basic gap phase of matter. This is how I personally got familiar with the subject. Um, I think it's fair to say that you no, know, this the defect and general symmetry has has really played a, a crucial role in our understanding of uh, phase of matter now, um, to say the least. And it has also become a, a confluence point. Uh, for high energy theory, the formal high energy theory and condensed matter theory. So even though the topic is somewhat uh, a little bit of a deviation from the usual theme of the seminar series, uh, from what I can tell, I hope it's still appropriate, at least entertaining. Um, all the new results in this talk uh, are contained in these three papers, but I will also take the liberty to discuss um, some results, some relevant results, not necessarily from myself. Okay, all right. So um, I was told that the, the main audience of this seminar series are mostly high energy theorists, even though I, I saw some uh, familiar condensed matter friends in the audience. Um, and in, in any case, I'll start from uh, reviewing the background or you know, what the problem um, is at least from my perspective. Okay, so, so what I'm interested in is uh, understanding quantum many body phases of matter in the context of condensed matter systems. So let me first talk about you know, what the system generally looks like, okay? So many systems of interest uh, in condensed matter physics are modeled by you know, fermions, electrons mainly, and spins eventually are, which are also electrons, in in some sense, living on some lattice. Typically, that's what we have um, in solid state and maybe in other platforms. And uh, you know, usually we have some sort of model Hamiltonian, which have short range interactions. And in this setup, it's very natural to assume that the Hilbert space of the problem has a tensor product structure. Okay. So it's a tensor product of some Hilbert space um, on each site. So even though I make these assumptions, I'd like to just you know, make a few remarks about uh, situations, important situations that are not necessarily covered by the assumptions. For example, we can have long range interactions, which are not so uncommon. For example, Coulomb interactions or dipolar forces. And, and just I'll just say that many results can be extended to system with long range interactions. Um, we also encounter Hilbert space, which are tensor product, but subject to, well, which are obtained from tensor product Hilbert space subject to local constraints. Okay. And um, almost everything I say applies to the thermodynamic limit, but finite, system, finite size systems are also interesting to think about. All right. Okay, so what are phases? Well, um, no, just loosely speaking, phases are universality class of ground states. So um, there are many non-universal properties, but we just want to focus on the universal aspects of the physics, and that is supposed to be captured by the notion of uh, a phase. So uh, we can define phase thermodynamically, basically, um, F2 ground states, by the way. So uh, what I'm going to say is mostly about ground states. Um, and and please feel free to please feel free to stop me with any questions or comments. So the thermodynamic definition of phase is basically the absence of phase transition. F two ground states can be 
smoothly connected without crossing any thermodynamic transition, then um, thermodynamic fixed transition, then we, are, we consider them to be equivalent. Okay. And then the equivalence class is defined uh, to be a phase. Now we can make it a little more precise and concrete when the Hamiltonian has a gap. So for gap ground states, um, this definition can be further, <clears throat> can, be, can be just equivalently stated as the existence of a gapped path of Hamiltonian interpolating between the two ground states. Okay. Now, um, there's a, a notion of a trivial phase. You know, we speak about trivial and non-trivial things all the time. So, so we, we need to know what is trivial. So in this context, there's a, a very natural definition of what a trivial phase uh, means. That is the ground states that can be smoothly connected to a tensor product state. Since we have a tensor product Hilbert space to begin with, um, this is uh, well-defined. And uh, in talking about these phases, we're always allowed to stack trivial states. No, this is, so we're, we're kind of defining things in a sense of stabilization by these kind of trivial states. All right, so we have this notion of phases and this is especially um, can be made quite sharp uh, when there's a gap. Now, um, the problem can be kind of enriched by a microscopic symmetry group, G. So uh, throughout this talk, G will be a zero form symmetry um, and actually on site um, whenever that makes sense. And uh, G may contain both internal or crystal, crystalline or lattice symmetries. All right, so um, now what are we going to do with this concept? Well, uh, let me define this problem of classifying phases. So of course, you no, know, the, the problem that we really want to understand is to figure out what's the phase of the ground state for a particular given microscopic Hamiltonian. For example, Haber model or a Heisenberg model on some lattice. But this is difficult, and uh, the, you know, answering this in generality is clearly beyond us. Okay. So, so we change a problem um, to make some progress. And the problem that I'm going to kind of discuss, the broad problem I'm going to discuss, is, is the following. So, given the microscopic system, um, what are the possible phases of matter that can potentially emerge you know, with? Short range physical Hamiltonians as ground states of uh, short range physical Hamiltonians. Um, and here by microscopic system, I mean the Hilbert space and some global symmetry. And then there are some follow up questions. For example, um, you know, how do we characterize these phases, ideally in terms of physical observation of observables? And this, this question goes in handy hand with a classification question. I mean, usually if we, we understand how to characterize things, then we know how to classify things. And also you can ask what, what are the transitions between different phases, um, so on and so forth. Okay, okay so, so, so hopefully um, it's clear what, what the, the general problem is. Um, now, uh, a lot of knowledge about this question comes from the quantum field theory approach. Um, so let me now discuss a little bit um, this approach to the problem of phases uh, based on a field theory. Okay. So we start from some kind of uh, assumption, or you can say the postulate that um, you know, for at least for, for most um, physical Hamiltonians uh, that we are interested in, there is a well-defined continuum limit, there's a very defined continuum theory given by a relativistic quantum field theory, okay? Well, here relativistic is a somewhat a strong assumption. Um, many cases, in many cases, we do not we do not have a, a relativistic symmetry or Lorentz symmetry, but at least um, for what I'm going to do, I think this is a, a reasonable assumption to make. Now, this, this <clears throat> postulate that there's some well-defined field theory uh, is, similar in spirit to a notion of a, a quantum liquid state, um, first uh, defined by um, Bateson and Xiaogang Wen um, a few years back. But there are clearly non-liquid states, for example, Fermi liquid, 
um, basically all the metals, and more recently the fracton models. Okay, so just to say that there are things which are not obviously uh, described by you no know, quantum field theory in the traditional sense. Okay, but um, but for gap Hamiltonians, I think this is better justified. Um, we can. I'll, I'm going to assume that they are described by gapped quantum field theories with Lorentz symmetry. And then, you know, if you really go to the infrared limit, they should become topo topological and quantum field theories. Okay. And then gapped faces are basically uh, deformation classes of topological quantum field theories. OK, so we can make some first. OK, uh, I think there's a there's question. A question. So yeah, I just had a Please. quick quick clarification about uh, for, so you're saying Fermi liquid is in your definition is non liquid state. Um, well, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I would I understand the caveat about fractons, but I'm I'm a little confused about Fermi liquid or you know even non Fermi liquid. Well, yeah. So I guess this is uh, somewhat uh, another very sharp definition. So uh, what I mean here is just that no. Obviously, it's not described by a relativistic quantum field theory, um, and it and there's a there's a finite scale in the problem that's a Fermi mm -hmm. defined by a Fermi surface. So so it's it's a, a pretty significant deviation from a usual sort of field theory. Uh, I think mm -hmm. I think that's all that's all I mean here. Okay. Uh, the other is clarification. Are you are you focus in this talk? Are you focusing on gap phases? Uh, Giving you introduction about uh, classification of phases, or um, it's going to be yeah. More so, so mostly this is about gap phases, right? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'll make two, two further distinctions um, about TKFT and phases. So, so we, there's a class of uh, somewhat relatively simpler uh, TKFTs, so invertible TKFTs which is defined um, by having all the partition functions of the theory on any closed manifold, uh, closed space-time manifold to be a phase vector. And, uh, and, and also relatedly, so you, for on, the, on any closed spatial manifold, there's a unique state. In the context of uh, a phase of matter, uh, invertible TKFTs are supposed to be um, no, the same or no, equivalent to the so-called short range entangle states. Okay. All right. And then there's non-invertible TKFTs, which are which have non-trivial topological operators, um, and they correspond to long range entangle states. All right. So <clears throat> the recent developments in this uh, no in the subject of generalized symmetry um, has made it clear that in order to characterize a quantum field theory, at least the kinematic structure, we should think about its generalized symmetries. So I think this is probably you know, well known to this audience that uh, quantum field theory is characterized kinematically by the generalized symmetries, but in order to make contact with microscopic physics, uh, it's you know, worth noting that some symmetries are not present microscopically, so they are emergent symmetries and broken by irrelevant operators. Now, for topological field theory, um, this the structure of general symmetry is particularly well understood. Um, and by now, we know it's described by some higher mathematical structure of a higher fusion category. And the invertible part of the fusion category forms a, a higher group, which I'll denote as G of IR, okay? the symmetry of the IR, symmetry group of the IR theory. So thinking along this line, we kind of we can kind of formulate a general solution, at least a formal solution to the problem of uh, symmetry enrichment, okay? in particular for internal symmetry G. So, so this internal symmetry G is a microscopic symmetry. And here I assume it's, well, it doesn't have to be zero form um, in this formulation, but let's assume it's a zero form symmetry. And then the solution to the enrichment problem can be basically given as classifying the homomorphism, I mean, the, the you know, appropriate generalization of homomorphism for higher groups 
um, from the microscopic symmetry group G to the IR symmetry group G. Okay. And then on top of that, we should consider invertible faces with G symmetry, uh, modulo some subtle equivalence relations. Okay, so even though with this kind of you know, abstract um, formal solution, uh, it's good to make it a little more concrete. And at least for me, that is down through symmetry defects. Okay. So let me define symmetry defects in the context of a microscopic uh, Hamiltonian. So generally defects are just modifications of the Hamiltonian along some low dimensional manifold. Okay. Now, um, here I'm only interested in topological defects, which means that these defects can be moved or can be moved along you know, different um, directions by applying unitary operators to conjugating Hamiltonian by unitary operators. Okay. So um, let's do it for a, a zero form on size symmetry and let us assume it's unitary. Okay. So for each, we know for each group element of the symmetry group, little g, uh, there's a symmetry transformation given by the tensor product of unitary operators acting on different sites. Okay. Now with this on-site symmetry, um, we can define a, a truncation or restriction of the symmetry operator to some region M. So M is a region in space. Okay. And this is uh, sometimes known as a disorder operator. By conjugating the Hamiltonian with the disorder operator, we create a defect along the boundary of M. Oh, since it's a symmetry, it commutes with Hamiltonian and it doesn't change Hamiltonian either inside or outside of this region M, but only uh, changes it along the boundary. So this way we create some defect, some co-dimension one defect. Um, the defect that we created this way are topologically trivial, um, but no, it doesn't really matter since we, all we need to know is how the defects are defined locally. And this is enough to figure out um, how to locally define defects um, uh, from the disorder operator. And now this is how we actually introduce defects in the microscopic model. So once we take the continuum limit, um, the, the IR sort of limit of these defects are given, are presumably given by this map row from the microscopic symmetry G to the IR symmetry um, G of IR. Okay, so for each element of G and the corresponding defect uh, will be mapped to you know, some symmetry of the emergent symmetry of IR theory. And this applies to um, higher co-dimension defects as well. Okay. All right, so um, for what I'm going to do, uh, I'll spend a few minutes to discuss this uh, thing I call defect decoration, okay? And this is relevant, especially for uh, the classification of symmetry protected topological faces. So let's consider the case of a symmetry preserving short range entangled state or uh, which roughly speaking, they're just symmetry protected topological faces. Um, by definition, this, this theory is trivial. It doesn't really have any interesting topological operators. So in some sense, um, there's no symmetry intrinsic to the theory. Okay. So G of IR is, is basically trivial um, to some extent. But now if we consider a co-dimension P defect from for the microscopic symmetry, we can ask the following question. So let's compatify the space to get an invertible state, to get us inversible state uh, living on the, a co-dimension D, co-dimension P D, uh, space, okay? so, or dimension D minus P. Little d is always a space time dimension, and I'll sometimes use the big D for space, the spatial dimension. So I denote this invertible state as omega D minus P. Okay. So now we can always do this. Um, to compatify the space on this co-dimension P defect and ask what's the invertible theory that we get from the compatification. And we'll say that this invertible state is decorated on the defect. Okay. Now, this is invertible state. So no, it should belong to the group of the symmetry enriched, well, symmetry, the short range entangled faces 
of that dimension. And now denote this group by h of uh, little h of d minus p. Okay, okay so no, this is something we can do for all the defects and all co-dimensions. And we get a series of uh, you know, invertible phase, which are supposedly uh, at least part of the characterization of this phase. And there's various consistency relations um, you know, among these decorations. For example, we can easily see that this decoration needs to be an element of some uh, cohomology group um, with uh, of G with coefficient in in this star range entangle star range entangle phases. Okay. And there are some further conditions. So eventually they will be assembled into a, a mathematical uh, structure of a, a spectral sequence. So well, I'll, I'll come back to the question yeah. by Nadi. Yeah. Hi Mark. You know. uh, given that you assume that my Microscopically, there is no symmetry. And, and as you said, some of the symmetries are violated by irrelevant operators. And when we compactify them, it's even worse because it, it could even be violated by operators that are not point-like operators, but they become point-like after the compactification. Given that, how much of what you say here is exact and how much of that is only approximate in the low energy theory? Um, yeah, let's see. So, so here I do assume there is some microscopic symmetry. So, no, that's, that's uh, the defects. The defects are defects of the microscopic symmetry. Okay. So we can start from whatever state with that symmetry and construct a defect. And I see. So it, it, because earlier you said that we start from a trivial state that there's no symmetry. There's no, it, so uh, that's what you say at the top of this page. Right. So in the case, in the trivial theory, there's no, let's say, there's no emergent symmetry intrinsic to a theory. I, I, I can break whatever emergent symmetry I, I have um, by, you know, all the irrelevant operators, even those that no, no, arise. My question is about the UV theory. You said at the top of the page, since the theory is oh, trivial, oh. I assume oh, okay. you refer to the UV theory. Yeah, there's okay. no so, symmetry that, intrinsic to the theory. That the, the line is actually... Uh, supposed to refer to the IR theory. Ah, okay, thank you. So the theory here is the IR theory, not the. Yeah, theory. Sorry for the confusion. Right. So, thank so, you. Yeah, no, so. that's a good clarity. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So, so this is about the defect decoration. I'll, I'll use this terminology later. Okay. okay. Um, yes, Leo. Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm still a little bit confused. So, you know, a state that has no symmetries, or at least doesn't rely on on symmetry for its properties, and it's short range entangled. So we're talking about some, the initial state as a trivial state, or um, well, so the, the, what I mean that this uh, the this state uh, in the IR limit is just a trivial. Well, no, without thinking about the microscopic symmetry, the UV symmetry is a trivial state. To begin with, meaning it's continuously connected to a product state. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Right. So I'm trying to understand where. Okay, so you start with a trivial state in the in the IR, and what is the and what are you trying to do with it? What are you trying to do to that state? You trying to construct another state? So what I'm trying to do is that no, we start from that state, but we do have some microscopic symmetry in uv okay. and mm -hmm. in uv the lattice model whatever i can i can construct defects of this microscopic symmetry i can mm -hmm. ask you no know, what is the fate of this defect in the ir limit i see i see and you no know, i can assign an invertible state to the defect to that particular defect and you no know, this is part of the the data the information in order to characterize uh, this phase. I mean, of course, we're thinking about the UV symmetry together. But so, but what I'm trying to understand is in the IR, the state is trivial. So what are the symmetry defects of, you know, co-dimension P symmetry defects? What are they, are they characterizing some subtle properties that I, of the, of this, IR trivial state, or what are they? What are they encoding? Well, 
Oh, so so what do they try to right about well, that trivial state? So maybe maybe let me let me say two things. So first, it's it's trivial IR theory, but that's when you when, when we don't consider the the microscope UV symmetry. If you forget about all the symmetries, mm -hmm. it's IR trivial. That's what I mean by a trivial theory. Um, but these decorations on defects. They encode how the global symmetry acts on the theory. This is how we get a different, you know, symmetry protected topological faces. I see. I see. So there's something non-trivial. The fact that UV theory has some symmetries right. means the there's UV something non -trivial symmetries. about the IR. Um, well, I guess it, this is you no. Know, this depends on how we think about it. Things, you no, know, when we define face. Uh, we do have to keep the UV symmetry in mind, at least no, in this, at least in the in this story. Um, so we can we can ask separately about you know, what is IR theory, whether it's trivial or non-trivial. But then, in order to define the, this phase, we should consider the UV symmetries as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hi, man. Uh, can I ask a quick question? Sure. So, yeah. how do you uh, construct uh, this defect twisted operator uh, Hamiltonian on the lattice? So, if you if you have some co-dimension p uh, symmetric state that you right. want to twist the Hamiltonian by along some like on the previous slide, you had this you you applied this defect operator on an open patch, which basically modified the Hamiltonian on the boundary of that patch. Right. Now, if you also want to decorate some state on the boundary or some, on some higher core dimension uh, uh, locus and twist this the Hamiltonian with this network of states, how how would you do that concretely uh, in lattice setup? In the lattice setup, um, we can do it when with, for example, some fixed point Hamiltonians. Right? It means that when we truncate a symmetry the a symmetry operator. As you just said, you no. Know, to get this defect, uh, we can also apply some additional unitary operators along supported on the boundary, so it does not actually uh, excite Hamiltonian, the ground state. And this is one way to kind of make it concrete what the decoration means. And you can also do this for higher co-dimension defects. But uh, we don't have to know exactly what is, uh, you know, the, the unitary that we decorate. Um, right. See, all we need to do, all we need to do, is to to construct a defect in its kind of bare form and ask what is the theory we get um, when you compare it. Thanks. Okay. All right. So now, um, let me now discuss a, a concrete. Well, let me discuss a, a known solution to a problem clarification for uh, the you know, for the kind of uh, bosonic symmetry protective phases. Um, following this uh, proposal that you no know, these short range entangled phases are classified by deformation classes of invertible TKFTs, um, by now there's at least uh, a very well motivated and accepted uh, conjecture that these phases are classified by some sort of cobaltism. Um, the precise term is the Anderson dual of Baudism group, uh, which I'll just denote by this, you know, okay, this notation. All right. Um, and there's a, a subclass of these faces given by the so-called group homology, uh, which is just a homomorphism from group homology to this uh, cobaltism group. And more explicitly, we can write down a Euclidean partition function for the invertible TKFT um, on some manifold M equipped with a background gauge field A uh, in the following way. So just a pullback of uh, you know, the co-cycle, uh, the group co-cycle to the manifold. Okay? When we view A as a map from uh, the manifold to the classifying space. And the elements of uh, this cobaltism which are not in the image of uh, homology are sometimes called a beyond homology. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I'd like to give one example. Um, and since this example will feature later part in the talk, so I'll just discuss it, even though it might, might seem you know, not very particularly well motivated why we want to consider this. 
But anyway, I'll discuss this example of uh, an SPT phase protected by a ZN symmetry um, in four plus one dimensions. Okay. This is perhaps not the, the physical space time dimension uh, relevant to, to condensed matter physics, but at least its boundary is three plus one dimension. Um, so that it's, it's relevant, uh, remotely relevant to problems like while um, fermions in three plus one. Okay, so um, there are two kinds of uh, SPTs, ZN SPTs in four plus one given by the following two actions. The first one is a group homology, which is basically uh, a kind of a, a transign described by a transign the response described by transignment's term. Here, beta is a block stand homorphism. And the second one is given by A cup P1, where P1 is a pound dragon class. So S1 is good cohomology, and S2 comes from a decorating the 3D invertible TKFTs, which are so so-called EA states on co-dimension two ZN defects. I just want to know that when n is multiple three, this action for the beyond cohomology um, SPT has to be modified. There's some interesting um, consequence, uh, but I'm not going to discuss that uh, here. Okay. Now. Um, if that appears somewhat uh, unclear, so there's a, here's another way to think about decoration. So if we make um, these defects of a ZN symmetry, so ZN has a, is, has a generator, we take the generator and creates defects and fuse N identical copies of these defects. Okay? So we should get nothing because you no, know, this is a ZN group. However, in this case, we will be left with a E8 space. Um, once we fuse n copies of the defect, at least for the k2 equals one, sorry, it's so a k2 copies of the E8 phase. All right, um, so that serves as sort of a, a general kind of introduction um, to what I'm going to discuss. So I think it, I, might, I, I, I should uh, pause to see whether there are any further questions. If not, um, now let me give a kind of a quick outline of uh, what I'm going to what I'm going to do. Um, since I've already spent half an hour, I, I don't think I can actually go through uh, all the things I plan to discuss. But anyway, so no, we'll just uh, see how far I can go. Uh, I'll discuss, as I said in the as I mentioned in the beginning, though this is more like applied uh, generalized symmetry. So I'll discuss two applications of uh, defects in understanding phase of matter. Um, both are at least motivated by uh, questions in condensed matter. So one of them is topological phases with lattice or crystalline symmetry. And the slogan is that we should think of them as uh, a defect network, a static network of defects. Um, and then there's uh, a topological phase with a quench disorder, which the slogan, and there's also a slogan for this, that is, we should think of it as an ensemble of defects. Um, I should uh, just want to mention there are many other generalizations of you know, this kind of topological classification to new settings, uh, and they keep kind of uh, um, emerging. So, for example, to gaplet states, or even to dynamic evolution, or mixed states, and so on. All right. So, let me now discuss topological phases with crystalline symmetries or spatial symmetries, lattice symmetries. Okay. So basically, these are symmetry transformations which move coordinates or points around in space. Okay. Uh, here, I just showed a schematic plot of a system with a, a, a C4 uh, rotation symmetry, the four fold rotation symmetry. Okay. So, um, so this is somewhat different from the case of internal symmetry, where we are very accustomed to think about background you know, gauge fields of internal symmetry. Um, it's at least less familiar um, to think about background of crystalline gauge field of crystal symmetry. Okay. But um, no, but it turns out that we don't actually have to think about it um, in terms of a background gauge field, sort of a, but uh, since there's a a picture of uh, a crystalline topological phase in terms of a static defect network. Okay. 
So here I showed uh, what a, a spec defect network looks like. Um, so in a system with a C4 symmetry, there is a rotation center you know, where we, we do rotation around it. And the sort of solid lines represent two co-dimension one defects passing through the rotation center and they're related by the rotation. And then at the center, there's also a code dimension two defect. So the claim is that you know, any crystal topological phase can be deformed to this defect network on top of some sort of reference or you know, the canonical state. For example, for SPT phase, the canonical state can be chosen as just a trivial product state. And then we just have a few defects sitting there um, to encode what the crystal in symmetry is doing. Okay. So, uh, this um, defect so, network is uh, uh, topological or can be non-topological? Um, so the defects are topological defects. Thanks. Yes. Sure. Okay. So um, why is why we why is this, is this why is this a by that when you say topological, do you mean that we can wiggle them or we can just shift them? In, in uh, we can we can wiggle them. But but there, you know, some of the defects are pinged. The location of some of the defects are pinged. For example, the uh, the co-dimension two defect at the rotation center it's pinged there to preserve the rotation symmetry. So we cannot literally shift them. Um, but for example, for the co-dimension one defect, we can definitely wiggle them as long as we keep the rotation symmetry. We can wiggle one of them. The other ones will be wiggled in the same way to keep oh, the. Symmetry. I see. So we cannot wiggle just one of them. So we can wiggle them locally, but then we have to wiggle all of them in the same way to keep the symmetry. That's Otherwise, not the case. That's not the case for the other defects. Can be um, locally. Yeah, yeah, that's. I mean, that's true. But in this case, the, the thing that we can wiggle one of them, and the other ones are just copies of the same defect. I see. So in this sense, um, we can kind of think of them as topological defect. Do, do I understand correctly that the, the, the statement is that if you have a C4 symmetric Hamiltonian, say, you mm -hmm. can turn on a defect background, which corresponds to conjugating with the unitary that creates a C4 symmetric network of, D, of uh, gap phases. So here you have a gap phase at only the red point. But in general, if you have some other global symmetry, you can decorate Four dimension one, four dimension two, and you conjugate Hamiltonian with this unitary to create these defects. Is, is that what the basically? But um, maybe let me let me restate what Apu just say, just said. So um, what I what I was saying that you start from some state gap state with C four symmetry, and I can use adiabatic evolution to deform it into some reference state, but on top of the reference state, we have to create some defects by you know, doing what you just said. So this is what I mean by a defect network. All right, um, now let me give an argument for why this works, um, at least in the context of uh, quantum field theory, assuming there is a nice field theory description of what happens, so again, let's suppose, just to make it concrete, let's suppose the lattice system has a C4 rotation symmetry generated by a little r. Now, the continuum theory, at least um, you know, in the, in, according to my assumption, has a much larger symmetry group, has Lorentz symmetry, including continuous rotations. Okay? So we can ask, what's the, what is the continuum limit of the C4 generator little r? So the continuum limit r, should also rotate, since by definitions it's a rotation. So it must contain the pi over two rotation of the continuous rotation group. Okay. But it's in the end, but it comes from a, a discrete rotation in UV. So it can also be combined um, with some internal symmetry, which I call U of R of the continuous or the continuum theory. So this U of R is an internal symmetry of the quantum field theory. And um, we called it in this paper with Nadi, uh, we call it an eminent symmetry. Even though that in that context, it was translation, but no, we can also do it for a other spatial symmetry. 
Hey, Amen. Um, can I ask a question? Hey, uh, sorry. Again, Dominic. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear. Yeah, I didn't hear uh, your question. Well, I didn't ask it yet. So the, the, okay. you have a gap system. So you're talking about TQFT, uh, unlike your previous paper where you introduced eminent symmetry. So TQFT, like the TQFT, doesn't really have any global symmetry at all, right? So in right. what sense can we say there is a Lorentz symmetry? I mean, there's no action on the Hilbert space corresponding to this Lorentz symmetry. Um, I mean that's true, but it there's no action that means that it it's it has an even much larger symmetry than Lorentz symmetry. It has all the diffeomorphism. But this is kind of trivial symmetry. Like there's no operator this U U R that you're writing. Right. Or... Maybe for this purpose, let's just say we can let's think about um a gapped quantum field theory. You know before taking the limit all the way to the IR to make it uh, a TKFT. Uh, well, okay. Um, I, guess, I guess that's not very satisfactory to your question, but um, no, maybe that that's enough for this purpose. All right. So I like to think about uh, the, def the net defect network. So, so basically we can have the quantum field theory but with now the defects of this uh, U over R symmetries. And when we are in this state, which is a quantum field theory state plus this U of R defect, if I do rotation, I'll pick up the action of these defects. Um, and that is supposed to be equivalent uh, to the mic microscopic uh, symmetry little r. I'm puzzled about the UV definition of this defect. Macroscopically, whether it's gapped or not, as Dominic said, uh, we could say that we have a new symmetry Z4 generated by U sub R, and then we can have standard defects for it. But then I can wiggle one of them, and it doesn't matter what, and I don't have to wiggle also the others. And of course, this is only approximately true at low energies. But that on, in the UV, we don't have separate the U sub R and big R of pi over two, but only their product. So how okay. do you define it in the full theory? Or well, is this something that makes sense only in the infrared theory, but not in the full theory? Well, in the full theory, as you said, we just have the little R. We don't really have uh, U of R and then big R separately. Right? Here, um, I just want to provide uh, a, a construction to produce the same rotation from the IR theory. No, we can yeah. have I think actually, if, if you are having a gap theory, then the answer to my question is really the question that Dominic just asked. Namely, mm -hmm. in the IR, your big R doesn't act. Therefore, whatever you have for little r becomes a defect for U sub r. Right. So that's yeah. actually, sorry, for gap system, that's, that also answers Dominic's question, but that's not the answer you gave earlier. Yeah, I guess I give a different answer. Since in the TKFT, I mean, you know, all of these symmetries are acting in some sense trivially, right? Um, so we have to basically include some, in this case, some invertible defect in the TKFT by hand to, to, to kind of simulate, to emulate the action of little r. Um, in the in the IR system in the UV system. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, I, I hope uh, answer the questions. All right. Uh, now, so let me let me say a few words about uh, the classification of crystalline to particle phase, which um, I'm still not largely... happy. Sorry oh. that I take so much of your time. No, it's all right. <laughs> oh. Yeah. If we have Z4 in the IR, and this right. is an ordinary Z4 defect, then mm -hmm. we don't have to have four of them. We can have just one of them coming out of a point. Right. That's something we can do in the IR. Is there a corresponding thing in the UV? Sorry, so uh, we, can have just, we can have just one defect, you mean, um, for the Z4. Well, in, in this picture, you have four defects 
coming out of the same red point. Right, right. Yeah. But if I'm an IR person and all I have is the internal symmetry, whose defect is UR, then I can have a defect that ends at the point, at the red point, and have only one of them. Right. Uh, by specifying the holonomy around it to be some Z4 element. Is there a right. corresponding UV construction of this defect? I mean, um, no, as you know very well, one construction is that we can consider the partition function and insert symmetry operator in the in the in the trace, and that counts as a temporal defect. Um, but I think we can also have some analog of uh, a single defect, um, a, a, a twist, by creating something like a, a, a lattice defect uh, in the U. Yeah, but that would not. This would not have the right symmetry because in this case, the defect. We, the resulting symmetry should be Z3 rather than Z4. Yeah, that's that's true. Um, that I don't have a good answer. Maybe, maybe Dom okay. can take and comment. Um, Thank you. Sorry, how do you see that it should be Z3 instead of Z4 if you put the microscopic uh, ro rotation defect? You just re remove one quadrant and you glue Basically, it. Basically, remove one quadrant and it looks like now we have three quadrants. I see. Okay, so um, let me just say a few words about um, the classifications following this set of ideas. Um, so, so the heuristic argument, I didn't quantum field theory approach, we can replace crystal symmetry with the eminent symmetries, the symmetries that, uh, with the internal symmetries arising from rotation. And then we can at least expect that the classification is the same as the one for just internal symmetry. So this was formulated uh, in, in a much more <clears throat> careful way um, by Dominic and Ryan um, in this as this crystalline correspondence principle. We can also directly construct and classify the defect network. So, um, so one use of the defect network, at least for what I'm going to do, is that with this picture, we can translate and, and with the help of this crystalline correspondence principle, we can translate results between crystal symmetry and internal symmetries. And actually, in many cases, the crystal symmetries, uh, crystal topological phases are, are, are somewhat more you know, user-friendly, at least for doing some calculations. All right. Um, so now let me delve into this example of, uh, again, of this ZN SPT. So that's the little puzzle I want to solve with, with this trick. Okay. So I've discussed these two actions. And uh, let me ask the following question. So, so let's consider this beyond cohomology phase described by S2, the A cup uh, P1. Okay. Um, and let's consider the K1, K2 equals one. So it's like the generator of this S2 uh, phase. Does this root phase, the generator phase, admit a topological boundary or not? Now we know the boundary has to have a uh, total anomaly, so it cannot be a trivial theory. And the next simple, simple thing, simplest thing is a topological boundary state. Okay. So such a boundary state was constructed um, for the n equals two case, the z two case, in this work by Lukas, Fitkowski, and Har and Hastings. Okay. So what about the other n? Now there's a, a beautiful result by um, Clay and Cantaro that which we can utilize here to show that if n is not one of these numbers, then there exists no topological boundary for the, for the root state. Okay. So, but for these numbers, um, can we construct a topological boundary state? All right, so I'll try to answer this question, not directly in the ZN case, ZN version of this, but for a related CN um, topological phase. So applying the defect network picture, we can think of the CN SPT as basically having two sets of defects. You know, there's this co-dimension one defect, which are three spatial dimensions um, uh, depicted as dashed lines. And on these defects, there's no remaining symmetries. The CN symmetry just takes one of this defect to another. So there's no remaining symmetry, internal symmetry on the defect. Okay. Therefore, 
we just apply the known result of uh, invertible faces in 3D, in, three, in 2 plus 1D, and we get nothing. So we don't have to do anything along this, uh, um, sorry, along this, uh, sorry, along this uh, co-dimension 1 defects. Now, if we go to co-dimension 2 defects, well, these are two spatial dimensions. Okay? So they are sitting at the rotation center. At this center, the, the CN symmetry is reduced to ZN. And we know in that case, we have some non-trivial states and it's given by uh, integer Z times ZN. Here, Z is generated by the EA state. Okay. So the claim that these states by obtained by putting the EA state at a rotation center, they actually correspond to this beyond cohomology SPT, S2. And uh, there's a little further issue that one needs to resolve. That is uh, how to go from Z to a finite order group, but no. This can be taken care of. All right, so now let me discuss the boundary state. Okay. Um, so the boundary state of this SPT should have two anomalies, okay. but there's a particularly simple picture for the boundary state uh, in this CN defect network construction that is on the three plus one boundary. So I always have a two dimensional picture. This is all I can draw. Um, on the three plus one boundary of this four plus one state, I have just the edge of the EA state, which is a one plus one EA level one component field theory. So for this root state with a single EA at the center, the boundary just looks like empty space, but with the EA gap, EA CFT at the rotation center, which is now a, a line in three dimensions. So I'm going to construct uh, a gap boundary when n is one of these numbers. And the construction proceeds as a follow. Okay. So first, let me say what the result is. So the result is a three plus one Z2 gauge theory. It turns out this is sufficient uh, for all of these different n. And it's one with a fermionic charge. So we can write down action in terms of a two form Z2 gauge field and the action just B cup V. And this TQFT has non-trivial invertible co-dimension one defects. Um, I guess we would say call them condensation defects. And they are obtained by gauging topological superconductors, uh, no, two plus one dimensional topological superconductors embedded in the three plus one Z2 gauge theory. Uh, when we ungauge um, the anomalous two form symmetry to have a fermionic system. Okay? So these defects will be labeled by uh, half integer C minus, which are the chiral central charge of the topological superconductor. And it takes value from you know, zero, one half, all the way to 15 over two. Okay. So they are kind of 16 fold defects. Now the boundary state uh, looks like the following. So we have this three plus one Z to gauge theory and we put a network of this co-dimension one defect, the gauge superconductor defects, um, no, in this kind of uh, a CN symmetric way. Okay, so for each n, the defect should have a central charge uh, eight over n. Okay, so that's the boundary state. Now let me very briefly discuss uh, the construction. Okay. So the construction goes like following. So first I want to construct a defect. So let's start from the state with just the E8 level one CFT along the rotation axis and nothing else. But to gap it out, I'll bring in four copies of some two plus one topological field theory, which are just denoted as B. Four, uh, bringing four half infinite planes of such TQFT and make them in meet at the rotation center in a kind of rotation symmetric configuration. Okay. And it turns out that this B, there's almost a unique choice of this B, which is a spin 16 over N level one TKFT. So there's no, we can, we can argue that, but let's just take that as given. We, we bring in these copies of uh, TKFT and make them meet at the center. And uh, to kind of help visualize what's going on, we can fold all of them to just now multiple layers of this B theory and 
uh, the rotation center becomes a, a topological boundary of these four copies of B to an EA state, an invertible state. Okay. So what we need to do is to make sure that this rotation center, which was gapless before bringing all of these four N copies of B that can be gapped out uh, without breaking the CN symmetry. So it's a turn, it's turned into a question of uh, uh, checking whether we can have a, a symmetry preserving gap boundary or block boundary of this n copies of the B theory. Okay, which you no, know, we know how to do, and we check that it can it can be done. Okay, and once this is done, we can kind of heal the gapless stuff along the rotation axis, while this is now fully gapped. There's no gapless stuff left, but it is not a TKFT because I mean, it's not even a nice topological theory. It's highly non-uniform and in some sense discontinuous. So we like to you know, modify it to make it more like a topological theory. Okay. And here we are bringing this three plus one Z2 gate theory with fermionic charge for the reason that this B theory in two plus one, they also have a fermionic particle, a fermionic anion. So we bring in this copy of uh, the three plus one Z2K theory, and we'll perform anion condensation that could basically identify the fermions on the B plane with the fermions in three plus one bulk. So once this is done, the B planes become invertible defects uh, of the kind that I introduced earlier, is a gauge topological superconductors, which generates you know, the eminent symmetry. Okay. Now, um, so this finishes the construction of a topological boundary state for the CN SPT. And now I just basically want to take this construction and turn the eminent symmetry into an actual internal symmetry. And that should correspond to the boundary of the ZN SPT. Okay. So no. Uh, I'll state as a conjecture, conjecture the same TKFT with ZN realized by these gauged super, superconductor defect uh, saturates the anomaly of the Bianco homology ZN SPT. And uh, while this may, may sound like a, a very exotic problem, um, we have uh, similar results for <clears throat> fermionic SPT faces whose boundary is just like, some copies of the wild fermions. Um, for both the ZN case and the CN case. Okay. Of course, the boundary state is somewhat different. It turns out that it's whenever you can make it a, a topological boundary, it's it suffice to use a, a Z4 gauge theory or some copies of Z4 gauge theory. Okay. Um, I just want to note one interesting difference between the ZN case and the CN case here, that in the case of a, a, a CN um, SPT, for at least for C2, where the internal symmetry counterpart has no topological boundary, the CN case can can sometimes have a non-topological, non-TKFT gap boundary state. It's gapped, but it cannot be transformed in any way we know into a topological boundary state. All right. Okay. Um, I'm almost. Uh, this is almost one hour, so uh, let me first finish this part by making two remarks. So this eminent symmetry uh, has some interesting consequence also for finite size systems, uh, which you know, have been somewhat known through many examples. For example, uh, the certain two-dimensional gap lattice models exhibit size-dependent ground state degeneracy, which can be understood as the lattice translation acting as non-trivial symmetries in the topological field theory, the IR. Okay. And the second example is that the ground state of the spin chain can have size-dependent lattice momentum, uh, which reflects anomaly of uh, eminent symmetry. All right, um, so uh, as I was expecting, no, I, I don't think I have time to discuss the second part that was in the plan. Um, so, since you have that, several questions, if you like, you can go on for a bit longer to. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. yeah, yeah. As you like. Yeah. For those who are interested, I can uh, 
continue, but yeah, let me let me wait for questions first. All right, so um, I'll quickly kind of flash to the second part. So this is about now thinking, this is about quantum phases in disorder systems. Now, everything I said earlier uh, was about a system which is clean, you know, a translation variant with all these uh, nice crystalline symmetries. But in reality, uh, we always, it's, it's inevitable that there are you know, imperfections, impurities or disorders so this is a quite relevant uh, problem um, for condensed matter uh, systems. Okay. So by disorder system, I just mean a clean Hamiltonian with, for example, some random potential. And um, so the H0 would be, sorry, there's a question in the chat. Oh, okay. All right. Um, H0 would be, you know the hopping Hamiltonian for electrons on the lattice, and it's it's completely translation variant. Um, but we can have some disorder random potential given by these epsilon of uh, little i, okay? and the big i labels different realization of disorder. So this is a quench disorder. So we really just have an ensemble of different Hamiltonians. So we have an ensemble of ground states, and this epsilon follows some probability distribution. Uh, which are assumed to be short range correlated. So which are you know, basically they are the different potential on different places are more or less statistically independent. Okay. All right. And uh, this potential breaks the lattice translation symmetry. However, if the probability distribution is translation variant, then the whole ensemble preserves the translation symmetry on average. Okay. So no, this is what we have in basically all real materials that the crystalline symmetries are at best um, preserved only on average. All right, so we can generalize this definition to just an arbitrary ensemble of you know, local Hamiltonians plus some disorder coupled to a local operator O of I. And the disorder potential follows some probability distribution, which are assumed to be um, short range correlated. And we have this ensemble of short range entangled states, which are basically ground states of this disordered Hamiltonian. So the ensemble has two pieces of information. One is the disorder probability distribution for disorder potential. And then there's a ground state for each realization of disorder. Okay, so um, I want to put out this notion of uh, short range entangled ensemble. Since now we are, we are kind of deviating from you know, the, the more conventional setting of thinking about the ground state as a single pure state. Here we have an ensemble of ground states, but it's not a, a very significant deviation because each of them should be basically short range entangled. Um, and that can be kind of kept, and, and, and we, we liked all of these things to belong to the same face. Okay. So we don't have two different faces showing up in the same ensemble. That would, so that's completely out of control. So that can be captured by this definition that has two parts. One is that the potential has only short range correlation and each state is short range entangled with uh, a, a finite bounded correlation length. Okay. All right, now, um, I think this is probably the, 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 the most important thing I, I want to say about disorder is that there are now two kinds of symmetries um, that one has to think about uh, in this context of ensemble. So let me again use this example of a translation variant Hamiltonian plus some potential. So this Hamiltonian H of zero is just a hopping of uh, electrons, which preserves the charge conservation symmetry exactly. So it's a symmetry for each individual Hamiltonian in the ensemble. However, the lattice translation symmetry is not preserved by one individual Hamiltonian. It's only preserved on average, meaning that if you translate, you'll find another Hamiltonian, you'll find a translated Hamiltonian in the ensemble with the same probability distribution. So it's only preserved on average by the ensemble. Okay. So there are two kinds of symmetries. One is exact, one is only on average, broken by the disorder potential. Okay. 
So the problem now is, you know, what sort of phase is a matter can we define with both exact and average symmetry? Um, I guess I'll make it very short. Just want to flesh out uh, the key kind of picture that we that we use to to classify this phase of matter. So we, for the ensembles. So the idea is that once you have these average symmetries, the symmetry is literally broken for each individual state. Now, if the symmetry is broken, in general, we can think of it in terms of domain walls. So the symmetry is broken by some other parameter and the other parameter takes different values in different uh, locations of space. So we can really think of this state as just a state of domain walls. And the fact that the ensemble preserve the symmetry make it you know, uh, appropriate to really describe these states in terms of domain walls. Therefore, the ensemble with an average symmetry should be thought of as an ensemble of domain wall states. And what this really means is that we can still define defects. We can still introduce defects for average symmetry, even though it's broken by the individual states. Okay. This is first because the disorder potential is short range incorporated and the symmetry is preserved by the ensemble. So even though it's broken, Individually, in the ensemble, we can still have a notion of defect for the entire ensemble. And when we have defects, we can talk about decorations of defects to classify the SPTs. Um, and then the story kind of just follows. So you know, we can have different decorations on different co-dimension co -dimension defects, um, except one, that is the co-dimension D defect. Okay. Well, there's really no co-dimension D defect. Uh, it's just a phase factor in you know, when we make local deformations of G defect. Okay? And in the clean classification, this co-dimension D is basically given by the group cohomology, group cohomology H of D uh, with U1 coefficient. However, now we have just a classic ensemble of defects. We should not have, we don't have really a, a re meaningful notion of phase factor for ensemble. So this last piece, the co-dimension D part of the defect decoration is no longer meaningful um, for the ensemble. So a consequence of that is the group cohomology SPT phases for average symmetries are all trivialized uh, when they become average, well, weak. Um, all right, um, the story does not end here. We sh can also think about, we should also think about whether these decorations are always legitimate, um, this leads to this is this is a question of whether we can actually make a short range entangled state from a particular decoration we want. Okay. There are various kinds of obstructions uh, that prevent us from actually constructing a short range entangled state from a particular decoration. However, some of these obstructions are released when we go from a short range entangled state to a short range entangled ensemble. So this opens a possibility of having certain decorations which were not allowed uh, in a pure state, but now becomes possible for ensemble. So there's some example of uh, that. Uh, simplest example is a one plus one uh, system with Z2 exact symmetry and Z2 average symmetry, which uh, are somewhat intertwined into this uh, short exact sequence. And uh, just flash through this slide. And there's another aspect of this, which I, I won't go into details, but has something to do with the localization, a phenomenon unique to disorder system of the symmetry charges. So in the end of the day, we have just a different classification compared to the clean case, uh, which share some common ingredients. So it's always, both of them are described in terms of defect decorations but the consistency conditions are different. So we just get a very different classification. And some of the states, some of the decorations have no analog uh, in a clean system. They have no clean limit. All right, and all of this can be more precisely formulated using a uh, spectral sequence. All right, I think this is uh, all I want to say. Um, and sorry for taking the extra time. So I'll just put up the summary slide.
Uh, maybe I can start with a question. Uh, sure. So if you, if you consider different uh, states in an ensemble, which have uh, which belong to different SPT classes of the symmetry that is on a, uh, that only exists on average, uh, can you still put defects and decorate defects and so on? Is the symmetry restored in the same way, or how does it change? So, so, so your questions. Let's start from uh, no. Let's consider two states in ensemble which belong to different classes of SPT for the average symmetry. That's right, yes. So first, um, once the symmetry is broken, it is no longer meaningful to talk about these different classes of SPT, but that's that's irrelevant for the purpose of talking about defects. So um, we can still introduce defects even when the symmetry is broken in the individual class in the following way. So to we can still apply the disorder operator to say one individual state in the ensemble. Okay. And that will not only modify the state, the clean part of the Hamiltonian, that will also modify uh, the disorder potential, which break the symmetry. So we will get a different set of disorder potential, the parameters of a disorder potential, at least inside domain of disorder operator. But because the disorder potential short range correlated, this will just give us another state in the ensemble, right, with with a different set of parameters of this other potential, but because all of these ensemble states in the ensemble are short range entangled, and the, the, the ensemble preserves symmetry, we can expect these two states they only differ by unitary operators along the boundary. Once we you know, change the parameters, the two states in the ensemble, which are related by the disorder operator. They only differ by unitary operators acting on the boundary. And this way we can define the defect decoration. But you can still so have, basic... yeah. I mean, you said that the symmetry is broken, but you can still have invertible states or if there's a subgroup that's preserved, you can have, I thought the question was whether you can have an ensemble where you have different, different such phases in the ensemble, like different phase, either different vertical phases or different phases protected by the residual symmetry group. Yeah, so maybe the exact symmetry SP, the, yeah, the, the, the yeah, two. I see, I guess I, I misunderstood the question. I thought it was about the you know, SPT phases of, a diff, of the average symmetry, right? But if you have, so, so in our definition, in this definition, we basically exclude this scenario where you have phases from different, um, Phases belonging to different SPT classes of the remaining of the exact symmetry. This is not allowed uh, in this definition. It would violate the condition that you know, any state in ensemble has a bounded correlation lens. Because you can, once we have two different classes, uh, we would we can construct another state which has a domain wall between these two states in the ensemble. And along the domain wall, there will be gapless states right. that would have you no know, infinite correlation lengths. Right. So the disorder can induce a, a transition in the exact symmetry. So, well, we, we basically we don't we do not allow disorder to introduce transition um, for the exact symmetry. So all of these are in the same phase, if you like. So the simple example, you just start from some clean SPT and turn on disorder, but disorder is weak. So we don't actually close a gap. Of course, the definition goes beyond that class of examples, um, but that's no, that's a familiar setting uh, where we have this sort of ensemble. I think there's something in the chat. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, I think that that's, sorry. So that question is there any relation between the group G and the coefficient little h? Um, that's just a, sorry, a confusing notation. The little h is a group of uh, invertible faces. It has nothing to do with a symmetry group, G. So 
So uh, in your motivation, you started by talking about crystalline symmetries, but then I think what you were saying after that was really for internal symmetries. It seems like for crystalline symmetries, you want to combine this idea with the defect network idea. Is that if you explored this? Um, yeah, I guess it's a, this example I talk about is more like I you know, using the crystalline symmetry to to do some calculation for internal symmetry. Um, but of course, no. The result of the case no, of I, I mean in the dis in the case of the disordered average symmetries. Oh, 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 in the case of average symmetry. Sorry. So, um, in that case, in, in indeed, I mostly everything I said, strictly speaking, applies to internal symmetries. Um, but I believe the same um, formalism applies to crystal symmetries as well. It can, I mean, and it, it, it's probably more natural to apply to crystal symmetry because it's always on average. Are there any more questions? Okay, if not, I guess we can stop the recording. <laughs>